Once a year, I go to see my doctor, and I usually have to make the appointment nine or ten months ahead of time because they're pretty popular over there. And so I did that, and about a month before I, um, my appointment date was, I got an email. I couldn't find it, um, but it was there. And the email said, hey, just a friendly reminder that you have your appointment on this date. And this time has been specifically reserved for you. And if you don't show up, we're going to charge you $50. So respond yes or no. So I responded, yes, I'm going to come. I have it written down. I am ready to go. And then about a week before the appointment, I got this email, which reminded me that I have an appointment coming up and gave me the opportunity again to confirm, to reschedule, or to cancel. So I replied, I'm coming. And they replied, thank you for confirming your appointment. Again, a couple days before the appointment, I get this email. You have an appointment at this time. Do you have questions? And because by this time, I'm like, running out of patience and graciousness, I responded like this, good Lord, I'm coming, stop texting me. <laughs> to which they responded, our office is currently closed. <laughs> Why do they do that? Well, the reason that they do that is because people don't do what they say they're going to do. And when people don't do what they say they're going to do, several things happen. One, it breaks down trust. You can't run a business. You can't run a medical practice. You can't run a family. You can't have a friendship without trust that people will do what they said they're going to do. And when people don't do what they say they're going to do, it demonstrates a lack of care and concern for other people. If I didn't just show up it, it, I mean, I wonder how many times before they started sending out these reminders, somebody didn't show up, and the entire medical staff sat there for 20 minutes when they could have had somebody in that really needed to be seen, and how often, basically, it cost them a lot of money to reserve a spot that nobody used. It also showed that in a lot of cases, people will make excuses or lie or just wait to see if there's something they would rather do than actually show up. It also shows that people will not hold themselves accountable to following through on what they said they would do. I forgot to write it down. I wrote it down, but I forgot to look. I don't know where my phone is. My phone died. And all of those are just excuses. But here's the big issue for us. As followers of Jesus individually and collectively as a church, not being trustworthy, not caring about other people or what happens to them, lying, those things are not values of the kingdom of God. Because those things don't reflect the character of God. God is not like that. And because the goal for us is to become like Jesus, those are not things that should characterize us as individuals or as our community as a whole. So let's look at this through the text. So we're in James 5, just one verse today. And for those of you who are going, oh, it's just one verse, it's going to be short, sit back and buckle up. Um, James writes, Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. All you need to say is a simple yes or no. Otherwise, you'll be condemned. Now, first of all, a simple definition of terms. When James is talking about swearing here, he means promising. James is not talking about using bad words. So I did not say that it is okay to use bad words. I just said that's not what James is talking about here. So, and also, we know from our study of James that James likes to emphasize the teachings of Jesus. James is Jesus' half-brother. And so he's been around Jesus for a while. So I want to go back and look at what Jesus had to say about this, and it'll help us understand what James is trying to say. So Jesus talks about this in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, verse 33. Again, you've heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it's God's throne, or by the earth, for it's his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it's the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes 
or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. So these are pretty similar texts. The biggest difference in them, which is worth noting, is the change in the verb tense. When Jesus is talking about this in Matthew, Jesus' verb tense is, don't start doing these things. So James is writing in the very first church, maybe 20 years later, James's verb tense is, stop doing these things. So in the 20 years that ensue, apparently people have started doing these things. And the problem is that it introduces like this level of truthfulness. So I started with the example of my doctor, but we all know what it's like. We've all been stood up by somebody. Somebody who said that they'd meet you for dinner or they'd go to a movie with you. Somebody said that they'd sign up their kids to play on the same team as yours. Somebody that you made plans to do something fun with over the weekend. Somebody who said they'd bring their truck and help you move. Or they volunteered to help with the program that you run, wherever you run your program. You counted on them and they canceled or they just didn't show up. And it's really annoying and it's really hurtful. I thought I was more important to you than that. And it makes you want to not trust them the next time. And it does some damage to your relationship, especially if it's a pattern and they do it over and over again. It's hard to have a relationship with someone who you don't think makes you a priority and that you can't trust to do what they said they would do. And if we want to be honest, we probably have all dropped the ball a time or two. Now, of course, when we did it, we had a good reason. The other people, they're just losers. <laughs> and maybe we're just resigned. That's just the way it is. People can't be counted on. But it's a bigger deal than that because it represents so much more than that, especially for those of us who follow Jesus. Because what James and Jesus are talking about is that there shouldn't be these levels of truthfulness. But we act like there are. We ask, will you do this thing? And the person replies, yeah, I'll do that thing. And we're like, I'm not so sure. So we say, do you promise you'll do that thing? And they say, yeah, I promise I'll do that thing. But there's still a little bit of a doubt. So we bring out the big guns. Do you pinky promise that you'll do it? Because now we're really serious. Because if you say something, if you say you'll do something, you can get out of it. If you promise, you can still get out of it. If you pinky promise, you can still get out of it, but the person you flake on will be righteously indignant. You pinky promised. Here's a fun fact. That gesture is taken to signify that the person can break the finger of the person who broke the promise. So keep that in mind next time you pinky promise. <laughs> but there are levels in the text here too. I swear by my head. I swear by Jerusalem. I swear by the earth. I swear by heaven. I swear by God. All different levels of seriousness. And in that time, in that culture, the only one that you had to take really seriously is if you invoked the name of God. The rest of the time, you didn't really have to keep your promise. But Jesus is like, don't swear at all. Don't swear by heaven, because that's God's throne. Don't swear by the earth, because that's God's footstool. Don't swear by Jerusalem, because that's the city of the great king. In other words, God is in and through everything. And it's like, don't even swear by the hair on your head, because you can't control whether it goes gray or just falls out completely. So you got no control over that. So don't swear by any of it. Just let your yes be yes, and let your no be no. If you say you're going to do something, just do it. Because there can't be these gradations of trustworthiness. You're either truthful and trustworthy, or you're not. And then, did you notice the last verse of both passages? Yet, let your yes be yes, your no be no. Otherwise, you will be condemned. Anything else beyond this comes from the evil one. So this is pretty serious stuff. Why? What's the big deal? Because whether or not we're truthful, whether or not we're trustworthy, whether or not we keep our promises cuts to the heart of what God is doing in our lives, in our community, and actually in the entire world. 
So James is the pastor of the very first church. He's developing a community for the first time that demonstrates the reality of the presence of God, that lives differently, that lives counterculturally. And if we aren't people who keep their promises, we destroy what God is doing among us. But let's do a little bit of a deeper dive into that, into why promises are so important. So one of my seminary professors was an amazing ethicist, and he did incredible work in forgiveness. Most everybody who is teaching about forgiveness in the church owes a debt to Louis Smedes. And Smedes said, if forgiving is the only remedy for your painful past, promising is the only remedy for your uncertain future. What? I mean, you get the past thing, you know? I mean, if, if we don't forgive then we're just chained to our past. We we can never let that go. But what is it about making promises that helps us control the future? And Smedes goes on to say that making promises demonstrates our humanity. Making promises separates us out from the rest of the created order. And keeping promises connects us to who God is. Because when we make a promise, we create a future with someone no matter what, might life, what, no matter what life might have in store. And being able to help create the future is freeing. Because when you make a promise to someone, promise you know, just by definition is something that's going to happen in the future. When you make a promise to someone, you are saying, I am not controlled by circumstances. I'm free from the tyranny of the culture. When you make a promise, you demonstrate that you are not an animal controlled by your instinct. When you make a promise, you demonstrate that you are not at the mercy of your whims or your biological impulses or your family of origin pathologies. You are not just a combination of X's and Y's that are handed down to you by your parents. When you make a promise and you keep it, You demonstrate that you are a free person. You are a human being. You have agency. You are made in the image of God. And you share the creative power of God because you can create the future along with God. I don't know what the future holds, but today I promise that in 10 years, Deo Volente, God willing, I promise I will still be here married to you. That creates the future. And that's powerful. We know who we are by the promises that we make. You make a promise. You make a commitment at your baptism. You make a promise at your marriage. We make a promise every time we recite the Apostles or the Nicene Creed. You make a promise when you go to school. You made the promise that you would go to class, you would do your own work, and you would not cheat. It's an inherent promise that you make because every school and every college has a code of conduct, and you agreed to that. You promised that you would do that. Smeeds goes on to say, I'm well aware that much of what I am and what I do is a gift or a curse from my past. But when I make a promise to anyone, I rise above all the conditioning that limits me. When I make a promise, I say, I will be this person. I will do this thing. When everyone else tells you that you can count on nothing, you can count on me. When you're overwhelmed by what's going on around you, I will be there with you. When we promise to be there, we participate in the creative and redemptive purposes of God. And that's powerful. And that's why when we don't keep our promises, it's so destructive because it counteracts what God is doing in creating a new reality. It returns us to the primordial chaos before God brought order. It gives control of our bodies and our actions over to our basest desires instead of our highest and best selves. When we don't keep our promises, It destroys marriages and families and friendships and companies and churches. That's why it's so important to be a person of integrity, to be true to your word, to be trustworthy. And think about this. Our faith is based on the fact that God is trustworthy, that God makes promises and we can trust 
his promises. In another major world religion, it doesn't matter which one, but I guarantee you've heard of it, there is no promise for the future. When you die and you go to heaven, there's no promise that you get in. It is entirely dependent on the mood of God that day. If God is in a good mood, you get in. If God is not in a good mood, you don't get in. And there's no court of second appeal. Christianity is based on a God who makes promises and then keeps those promises. From the very beginning to the end of the scriptures, we have promises from God that he keeps. In the very beginning in the garden, God promises to be with us as long as we didn't eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Inherent promise there that we will be in relationship. We broke the promise. But then God calls Abraham, and he makes a covenant with Abraham. The thing that God says to Abraham is, I will be your God. I will be with you, and you will be my people. Moses, centuries later, is out in the desert wandering around, and he sees a burning bush, and God speaks to him during, uh, in the burning bush and gives him a commission, gives him a job. And at the end, Moses goes, I don't even know how I'm going to do this. People go, I don't even know who you are. I don't even know what your name is. And God says, my name is, and this is the best translation I know of that, I am the God who, be, who will be with you. God promises that he will be there. Jesus comes and lives, and when he's getting ready to leave, Jesus says, if I'm going, I promise I'll come back, and then I'll take you to be with me where I'm going. And the ultimate promise is that God is creating a new heaven and a new earth where everything is right and there's total shalom, total peace, total wholeness, and we are being called to live to that. And Peter says, we wait according to his promise. Our God promises that he'll be there for us. And when we keep our promises, we act like God. We participate in bringing the wholeness and the peace of God into our world. I will be there for you. I will be there with you. But those aren't the only promises of God. God says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. God says, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. God says, I will give you a future and a hope. There's all sorts of promises that God makes, and we know he will keep because truth and promise keeping are at the center of who God is and the community that he is creating. And that's why it's so critical We take this holy thing, this community that we're called to in Jesus' name, being built by the Holy Spirit. We take this thing that God is doing and we treat it like it's common, like it's nothing special, like the church is no important and no different than belonging to the Eagles Club. But it is. It's holy. And it's a trust from God that's been given to us. Your family, your friends, your job, and how you react to them are all a part of the transformation that Jesus is bringing about within you, moving you from being thoroughly immersed in the self-centeredness that our culture promotes to being thoroughly immersed through your baptism in the kingdom of God. Or not. When we don't keep our promises... We destroy what God is creating. We return our world to the primordial chaos. So you're listening to all this, and you're like, Michael, it, it's just dinner. <laughs> I just didn't go to dinner. Yeah. But if you can't be counted on to come to dinner when you said you would, Why in the world would I expect you to show up when I really needed you? Because you already demonstrated that you can't be counted on. But what about extenuating circumstances? I mean, sometimes stuff comes up, and we just can't do what we want to do. Of course. And you know what? This next week, if the Cascadian subduction zone finally lets go, I am okay if you don't show up to greet next week at church. Or if you don't come to my house for dinner, I will completely understand that. But honestly, generally that's not what happens. Generally, we don't do something because we got a better offer or because we just didn't want to get up off the couch that afternoon. And remember, it's axiomatic. We will create excuses. We will come up with all sorts of reasons of why we are victims, but it is axiomatic that we do what we want to do, and we don't do what we don't want to do. 
If you didn't do it, it's because you didn't want to. Now, there is one other, you know, extenuating circumstance that I'm willing to, to grant, you know, like a, you know, general pardon for, and that is on the brink of the coming cold flu and COVID season, dear Lord, people, if you're sick, stay home. Don't come out. It's okay. I still have PTSD from Christmas Eve last year, you know, when it sounded like the tuberculosis ward in here. And I remember leaning next to the person next to me and said, I bet by Wednesday I'm sick. And you know what? I'm a prophet. Wednesday I was sick. You get sick this, uh, this fall, stay home. We're online. You can't control very many of your circumstances. The one thing that you can always control is your character. Other things will come up. Some things are unforeseen. The one thing you can control is your character. I said I would do it, and I will. But we are all in favor of truth on the theoretical level. But when it comes to actually living truth out, it can be a little bit sticky because oftentimes being truthful creates an awkward situation. We don't really want to create an awkward situation. And so oftentimes, instead of being truthful and creating an awkward situation, it's easier to just tell a little white lie, because who is that going to hurt, right? But here is a verse from Scripture that you should memorize, just like you should memorize the one that, that Brendan had earlier. It comes out of Numbers chapter 32. It says this, your sins will find you out. It will happen, folks, because everybody that you come into contact with has a smartphone, and every phone has a camera, and everyone is on social media, and you cannot control where your image shows up. And I cannot tell you how many people have said, they told me that they couldn't come, but here they are. And I remember one time, this is, this is crazy. I'm actually glad this happened because it ended up being such a great sermon illustration. Uh, at the time, it was a little bit painful, but... Um, I was going to go out with somebody. We we're going to go have coffee. You know, so I'm looking forward to this. And they called me and they said, hey, I didn't realize that I have a doctor's appointment. I have to cancel on you. I'm like, oh, no problem. So I'm like, I'm just going to go down to the harbor and I can meet with somebody else. I drive down to the harbor, you know, click, you know, phone's off. I drive down to the harbor and here is the person out for a walk with someone else. And I'm like, what? Your sins will find you out. Just keep that in mind. Better to be truthful. But how do you tell the truth if it might end up being awkward? Well, here, here's a quick example of something that's going on in our lives. So at the end of the month, I'm um, performing the marriage of uh, a girl who was in our playgroup when our kids were little. There's about five different families. We raised our kids in, a com kids in a commune. You know, you just fed whoever kid was there. You yelled at whoever needed to be yelled at. It was just a thing of, thing of absolute beauty. And one of them is, is getting married th this next month. And so she called me, and they're going over RSVPs, and she said, Rachel, our oldest, RSVP, no, because she's in San Diego and she can't make it. She's like, but can Allie come? because I haven't heard back from Allie. Well, Allie just started being a nurse, and she doesn't know what her schedule is going to be like. And I thought, you know, the easiest thing to do is for me to say, yes, she can come, just because on the off chance that Allie can show up, then she has a spot. But I thought, you know what? If I say yes, it's probably going to cost them $150 by the time they pay for, you know, every per person cost. And I don't know if Allie can make it. So I'm like, instead of just, it would be convenient for me to save Allie a spot, I'm going to be like, uh, I'm just going to say no, because that way, you know, we're, at least we're being honest. So I decided to go the middle ground because I'm a covenanter, and I said, maybe. <laughs> and so this is what she said. She's like, okay, great. So we'll put her down as a maybe, and if she can show up, we'll just drag a chair over to your table. You know, no harm, no foul. I'm like, perfect. I could tell you what really was going to happen, and we were able to work things out. So sometimes just find a way to say it. But if there's something that you absolutely cannot do, you don't need to make up an excuse. In fact, sometimes I think we get in trouble because we over-explain. We just keep talking. You know, say what you need to say, and then stop talking. Just tell somebody that you can't do it. So, and you don't have to share everything. You know, so somebody invites you to spend the weekend with them in their cabin in Packwood. You do not have to say, I don't really like you. 
And I can't imagine anything more painful than spending 48 hours with you. You don't need to share that. Come up with a phrase. Something like, ah, oh, we just can't add anything else to the schedule right now. And then stop talking. And if they push you, then it's them being awkward, not you. We just, can you do this thing? Ah, oh, we just can't edit, add anything else to the schedule right now. Oh, come on, we really want you to be there. This is what you do. I already told you that I can't. Because you're just going to get in trouble if you over-explain. But always, whatever you come up with, be truthful and also be kind. Um, one of our friends was a youth pastor, and he moved into a new area, and he called a veteran youth pastor because he thought, this guy can mentor me, this guy can help me get, you know, accustomed into this area, and he called, and he said, hey, I'm new in the area, I'd really like to get together, you know, and maybe you can bring me up to speed, and we can hang out a little bit. The other dude goes, nah, I have plenty of friends. <laughs> Always be kind. <laughs> and remember, there are no little things. If you can't be trusted in the little things, why would you think you could be trusted in the big things? And that's countercultural, because we are taught that the highest priority is to be true to ourselves. But if the highest priority is to do whatever we want in any particular situation that will make us happy, we will break all sorts of promises. And if we do that, we're no better than the animals then just driven by instinct and chemical urges. And as I look out over this election season, I've just been amazed at how many social issues are at the forefront, forefront of the political discussion. And as I looked at various social issues, I was thinking, do you know how many of those issues would disappear if people would just keep their promises? It's staggering to think about. So let me ask you three questions. Number one, if you asked your closest friends, what would they say about your reliability? Number two, rather than lying, what is something you can say when you don't really want to do something? Number three, what promise have you made that you need to do a better job of keeping? Hi, thanks for watching. The people of Harbor Covenant Church really want you to know the love that God has for you, want to grow with you in faith, and want to serve alongside you, not only to help others do the same, but also to make our families and our communities better. If that sounds like something that you can get on board with, then like, follow, and drop us a comment in the video. Watch some more videos on our channel or come visit us on Sunday. You can find out more about Harbor Covenant Church at harborcove.church.